I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is February 26th, uh, 2020. And um, thank you for joining me again uh, for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, today's episode is going to be something very, very different than what I normally do. Um, I hope it's okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> So for those of you who've been following Mormon Stories uh, or me uh, for a while know that in uh, February of 2015, uh, I was excommunicated from the Mormon Church for apostasy. Um, it's the five-year anniversary of that excommunication. It's, it's February 2020. And um, what, what some may or may not know is that I recorded all of the interviews with my uh, bishops and stake presidents uh, leading up to the excommunication. Um, I guess some of you will know that because one of the transcripts from one of those interviews made it into the New York Times. Um, and if you Google John DeLynn, uh, Brian King, that's B-R-Y-A-N King, you can find the full transcript of that uh, meeting there. Um, but that wasn't the only uh, interview that I recorded, and I never released the audio from that or any of the other interviews. Um, but it was always my intent to. Uh, I just kind of had been waiting for the right time and the right circumstances. Um, in addition, uh, uh, you know, I've been opposed to disciplinary councils for a long, long time uh, without going into details there was a disciplinary council uh, in my family when I was a teenage boy um, that was very hard on uh, me and my family. And, uh, and then at BYU, uh, when I was uh, there as an undergraduate, um, I was there during the time of the September 6th where uh, several uh, scholars and thinkers were excommunicated uh, from the church, people like Michael Quinn and Maxine Hanks and Paul Toscano and others. And I've interviewed several people on Mormon Stories podcast who have been excommunicated uh, prior to, uh, you know, starting Mormon Stories, people like Brett Metcalf and, and others. Um, so I, I've, uh, I've always disliked ex, uh, disciplinary councils and excommunications. Um, and, uh, and so uh, before I was excommunicated, there were several individuals that were, uh, uh, excommunicated, including people like um, Kate Kelly and Rock, uh, Denver Snuffer. And, uh, you know, during or after my excommunication, there were several other people that are excommunicated, like Rock Waterman, Jeremy Runnels, uh, Sam Young, Bill Real, Cody and Leah Young, Gina Colvin, Dusty Johns, Amy and Jake Maloof, Jared Lusk, Stephen Bloor. And I did my best on Mormon Stories podcast to uh, cover these stories primarily because I, I felt like they were, uh, you know, I, I've always felt like disciplinary councils for apostasy were barbaric and medieval, and I spoke out against them whenever I could. <clears throat> so, um, I think a, a final thing that triggered my desire to share um, th these recordings was the fact that just this week uh, the Mormon Church came out with a new general handbook of instructions. Um, in 2020, and it completely revamped, um, or at least in many ways revamped, its disciplinary council process. It, it, it changed the name of disciplinary councils to something like membership councils. It, it actually expunged uh, the, the words excommunication and disciplinary council from um, the handbook of instructions, uh, and it um, changed the criteria for, for uh, mandatory excommunication and um, you know, optional, uh, uh, you know, uh, disciplinary councils, so mandatory disciplinary councils, uh, optional disciplinary councils. Um, it took apostasy off the list for a mandatory disciplinary council, and it's not even on an optional, uh, the, the list for optional disciplinary, disciplinary council, although, and again, it's a membership council, but <laughs> you get the point. Um, even though in some weird way, I think you can still have your membership removed uh, for apostasy. But regardless of all that, <clears throat> when I, uh, you know, made my excommunication very public, when I supported Kate Kelly and hers, when I supported Jeremy Reynolds and his, and uh, Bill Real and Sam Young and the Cody and Leah Young and all those who have been excommunicated, I did my best to fly out to wherever they were, 
to Facebook live stream their disciplinary councils um, and interview everyone who faced the disciplinary council or was threatened with the disciplinary council for apostasy because my goal was to have the church get rid of these things and stop it. And, uh, you know, in 2020, I can't say that they've stopped it, but they've certainly finally responded to all the pressure that uh, I and others have put on them. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm mixed about that. I'm kind of happy, but I'm also, <clears throat> you know, there's still a long way to go. So in the spirit of all that, in the spirit of wanting to release these interviews, I'm going to be doing that over the next day or two. Um, I'm going to be sharing six, uh, the audio from six interviews that I uh, participated in as a member of the church, uh, the six main interviews that led up to my disciplinary council. Um, and I'm going to be sharing that. And uh, I'll be offering a little bit of commentary here and there. Um, so a couple, you know, disclaimers that I want to make. Uh, um I want to make sure, you know, before you start listening to uh, these interviews, I want to let you know that, uh, you know, one of the main, another main reason I recorded these interviews was because um, when I saw people like Simon Southerton or Kate Kelly or even read about the excommunication of Von Brody, I saw that it was kind of the church's habit or history to, or, or maybe it's apologists as well, to spread untruths or disinformation or even outright lies about why people were disciplined because they're private things. You know, you can get excommunicated or disciplined for one thing and then have the rumor mill, you know, go about saying that you're being excommunicated or disfellowship for other reasons. And that certainly happened with me. I feel very, very certain that um, it was my, uh, you know, support of, of same-sex marriage publicly, my support of female ordination within the Mormon church. And then you know, my, my open discussion of difficult, difficult things on Mormon stories that led to my excommunication. But there were all sorts of people that tried to claim that, you know, ordained women and, and you know, my support for same-sex marriage. Um, and even Mormon stories had nothing to do with my excommunication. And, of course, my state president tried to tie it to um, some statements he was able to pull as my belief waxed and waned uh, over the years, as it did and as it, you know, often does for people who question their faith. So anyway, I, I also wanted to record these interviews uh, just so that it could be very clear why, kind of go down the history book as to why um, I was excommunicated. So, um, so I'm going to share these now. Uh, and I just want to also just offer a couple of disclaimers or reflections uh, number one is I don't expect that people are going to care about these interviews. I think many, many people uh, are going to view this as old news. Um, and honestly, if if no one ends up caring or listening to these interviews, I'll be total peace with that. I'm sharing them as a matter of public record. I've always wanted to. I committed to myself early on I would do that. And now's kind of the time. <clears throat> so, um, listen, if you're interested, um, I want to acknowledge up front that I recorded these uh, legally. In Utah is a one party consent state, meaning that as long as one person in a conversation is um, is aware that a recording is happening, it's legal to to make these recordings. Um, so uh, so they're legal, um, but I did not inform the, you know, the church leaders that I was interviewing with that they were being interviewed. I know that that's a uh, ethical conundrum, and I'm just acknowledging that. I think uh, when you get to the interviews with Brian King, he specifically, he knows at some point I'm likely interviewing him. So he tells me, he asks me if I'm interviewing, and I, um, I, I don't think that I, you know, um, well, Whatever I said, I certainly did not want him to know I was recording it because I, I, uh, I wanted a clear dialogue about why I was being excommunicated, and I feel like I deserved that, and I also felt like I needed to record it. So if I deny uh, that I'm recording um, these meetings, uh, uh, that's what I felt like I needed to do at the time. I'm not sure if I denied it or just kind of didn't. <clears throat> uh, didn't respond or, or didn't confirm or deny or tried to distract. But anyway, I acknowledge that that is an ethical, um, you know, conundrum. 
and I'm just acknowledging it. I want to make sure everyone knows I'm not sharing these uh, recordings because I think I'm heroic or because I think they make me look good. Um, and I'm also not trying to make any of these church leaders look bad or to punish them. Um, honestly, when I listen to these interviews, I, I it's embarrassing. It's, it's painful. It's like a train wreck. Um, I think the leaders were doing the best they could. Uh, I think generally they're all good men, or honest men, sincere men. And I was kind of putting them in a very hard uh, position. I could have just resigned my membership. Uh, you know, I didn't have to record the interviews. I could have just gone quietly and I didn't. I wanted to make my excommunication a, a very public event because I felt like the church was harming LGBT people. I felt like they were, um, uh, you know, oppressing women. I felt like the church was being dishonest about its history. I feel like uh, it was unethical what they're trying to do to get me shut down the podcast. And I just didn't, uh, and, I, and, I, and again, I'm morally and ethically opposed to disciplinary councils. So for all those reasons, I, I wanted to shine a big spotlight on it. I had watched the September 6th in 1993 just kind of disappear and, and kind of uh, fade into the Mormon obscurity. And I just wasn't going to let that happen, uh, you know, in the modern era. So, um, but, you know, again, I, I'm not th saying that I'm a hero here. I'm not saying that I come off great here. I'm sure I come off mixed. I'm sure the leaders come off mixed. Um, but I do want to say that uh, I, I really don't want anyone to get mad at or go after these leaders who, um, who interviewed me. Uh, I, I think they should be treated with love and respect. You may or may not like, you know, if you're a believer, you're going to tend to like what they did, how they comported themselves. If you're not a believer, you may not like some of the things. And it, it may be mixed throughout the board. But I just want to make sure everyone knows. Uh, treat these men, if you ever see them or run into them, with kindness and love. I certainly feel love and kindness for them now. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I really do believe that we were all kind of victims in a flawed system. Um, you know, and I, I believe that, that you go after systems, not people. And that's what I've tried to do. Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, I, uh, I'm now going to, I'll give a little bit of background for those who don't know anything about my story. And, and then I'm going to start just playing one after another, these interviews, and maybe I'll offer some commentary in between. And for those who are really nerdy or bored uh, or, or super curious, you're, you're welcome to come along for the ride. So uh, just, you know, most people know my story, but I'll just give a super, super brief summary. Um, uh, I was an active devout Mormon for many, many years. In 2001, I lost my faith uh, as a seminary teacher while I was working for Microsoft uh, in Seattle. Um, I've covered the reasons for losing my faith elsewhere, but, it, you know, Joseph Smith's polygamy, Book of Mormon historicity and anachronisms, Book of Abraham historicity, um, you know, uh, church's racism in the Book of Mormon and with blacks in the priesthood, his treatment of women, his treatment of LGBT people. Um, <clears throat> you know, the list is long as to why I lost my faith. You can go to cesletter.org or some of my other interviews to learn more. Um, but, but I still loved the church. I still cared about it. I wanted to see it succeed. And I had read uh, books by Kaim Potok, who um, talked about uh, how Judaism evolved from a very orthodox religion into, a, um, in some ways, a very progressive religion, at least um, in, in, in the cases of uh, Reform Judaism and Reconstructionist Judaism, where you didn't have to be literal believers uh, in Judaism to still be Jewish. And I was inspired by, by those books. And so, and, and I was also dismayed by how difficult my faith crisis was. And then all the friends that I had at Microsoft, how traumatic their respective faith crises were. And so, um, and so I decided that I would leave Microsoft and try and be a solution to the problem. So I left Microsoft in 2004, uh, moved to Logan, Utah, started a PhD program, learned about podcasts. And in 2005, I started Mormon Stories Podcast. And um, my goal with Mormon Stories Podcast uh, 
wasn't to tear down the church. It wasn't to take people out of the church. It was to was this naive hope that maybe if we talked openly about these issues that, um, that we could get to the bottom of them and even maybe help people stay in the church. And so that, that was my motivation. And so I started interviewing people. I was active in my ward in uh, North Logan, Utah. I even taught Sunday school there for several years. And then, um, so what happened was, both through my unorthodox uh, elders quorum lessons and also through Mormon stories, uh, you know, people started raising um, concerns to my bishops. Uh, my first bishop was Bishop Farmer, um, and uh, he was really great and supportive. He started questioning whether or not I was leading people out of the church, and so I, I asked a bunch of my listeners to send him letters, and hundreds of people sent letters to him saying that Mormon stories had helped them stay in the church, and that made Bishop Farmer, Kirk Farmer, kind of leave me alone for a while. Um, later, I had a new bishop, uh, James uh, Stevenson. We're going to be hearing from him in this first interview. Um, but, uh, but, but before I talk about James Stevenson, I'll just say that after a couple of years of teaching elders quorum, uh, I started to really, really struggle with my faith. Um, I also, uh, you know, started to feel less and less comfortable in my ward. Uh, I didn't, you know, there were some seasons, like let's just say a year here, a year there, where I was less active. But for most of the, you know, for most of the 15 or 16, I don't know, 12, wait, 2004 to 2015. So for most of the 11 years that I was in that ward, I was very, I was active and, and participatory. Um, but, but uh, I started to struggle. And so I would go in and out of callings and in and out of like uh, weekly attendance, just trying to make it all work. And uh, some of you will remember that after um, a year of kind of being out of the church, I missed it so much that in 2007, I came back and started the Stay LDS website, which the intent of that was to help people stay in the church. Um, and uh, anyway, um, there were probably three different instances where my church leaders initiated investigations against me. Originally, my stake president was um, Mark Jensen. My original bishop was, was Kirk Farmer. He kind of did an investigation. Um, then later, uh, Bishop James Stevenson uh, became my, my bishop. Um, and he, he, you know, brought me in and, and kind of uh, also, you know, conducted some investigations on me. You'll hear my interview with him here. Um, some of this comes around the time when I was uh, hoping to baptize my son around 2012. And um, it kind of culminated in this first interview where Bishop Stevenson calls me in uh, to kind of grill me about, um, you know, why I wanted to baptize my son and why I wasn't at church every week. And, you know, was I worthy? And, and he expressed some concerns about Mormon stories, etc. And I had been meeting with um, State President Jensen prior. He was trying to help uh, help me with my faith or talk to me about my concerns. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so, yeah, that's this first interview that I'm going to be playing is my, my, um, is my meeting on May 1st, 2012 with Bishop James Stevenson. Now, um, Bishop Stevenson wasn't directly involved in my disciplinary council, um, but but both but but it but it's important to bring. I, I'm bringing this interview and the one with Mark Jensen, my first state president, into this dialogue because, you know, I worked with President Jensen a year or two uh, around my faith, and he was a loving, kind man. Um, he ended up working really hard with me to try and help me with my my faith crises. And ultimately uh, allowed me to baptize my son Winston. It was a year after he turned eight, so Winston was nine by the time Mark Jensen allowed me to baptize him. But, but you know, I think it, 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 when you listen to my interviews later with Brian King, you'll hear me reference my my times with Mark Jensen. So I just wanted to give everyone a flavor. Number one of what I feel like is an effective handling, uh, for the most part, of my my doubts and my questions and my concerns. Um, I really do appreciate 
all that Mark Jensen did to try and help me. Um, and then I think it, it sets important context for the, the discussions with Brian King uh, that come later. Um, so what I'll take you to now is the very first interview that I'm sharing with you with Bishop James Stevenson, where he uh, wants to talk to me about my desire to baptize my son. Now, um, one important thing here, uh, I did, you know, all of most of the, these interviews are complete as far as I uh, best know in terms of the audio recordings, except for the first 20 minutes of this interview with Bishop Stevenson. And the only reason I took it out is because we talk about like iPads, we talk about, um, you know, as astronomy, we talk about our, you know, our, our, the ki our kids, and it's kind of like a, a solid 20 minutes of just uh, shooting the breeze and um, small talk. And uh, I just don't want to waste your time. There's nothing, you know, controversial or sensitive. And then, and then as far as I'm aware, all the other five interviews are, are complete from start to finish. But I just want to let you know that it's going to be a little abrupt. You'll hear me say hi to Bishop Stevenson, and then we'll talk for iPod, iPads for just a minute or two. And then all of a sudden he jumps in and says, I haven't been seeing you at church. And, um, and I just want to let you know that he wasn't that abrupt. Uh, I also just want to say that, um, you know, the, the, I believe that this idea of, you know, um, interrogating, investigating, and assessing someone's worthiness, you know, in the church based on their beliefs, considering them for apostasy. I just think it's a deeply problematic um, endeavor. I, sure, I was a progressive or liberal believer, um, you know, at this point in my life. Yes, I had I had sometimes doubted God and sometimes doubted Jesus and sometimes was critical of Joseph Smith and the church. But I think that's uh, I think that's par for the course for people who struggle. I don't think it's the role of leaders to interrogate and to assess and to gather evidence. What you'll also hear later on is that um, certain members of my ward and stake were sent out to gather evidence on me to try and break into private groups that I was a part of and to, to supply information back to the bishops and stake presidents. Um, you know, and it, it felt a lot like Gestapo or kind of Cold War KGB kind of investigations. And it was all just really unsavory for me and, and Margie and for our family. And so part of my desire to share all this as well is just, uh, you know, to kind of expose this idea that you have to have the right beliefs and, and say the right things to be considered a, a member in good standing. The, the bishop and stake president roulette that's often involved, depending on who you get, you'll get more or less lenience. And then this idea that comes through very quickly, very strongly towards the end that, okay, they're okay if I have my doubts and questions, but I can't talk about it. And so we all need to be silent about it. Um, and, I, you know, they, at the end, they wanted me to shut down Mormon stories and never speak publicly again. And they were mad at me for doing my TED Talk, supporting LGBT uh, people in same-sex marriage. And they were mad about me supporting ordained women. And just this idea that, yeah, you can be a member in good standing if you're silent. Uh, you know, it's okay to have doubts, but you have to be silent about it. And that you can't criticize the church or its leaders or disagree publicly with its policies. I just think that's ridiculous. And so you're going to be able to get a clear sense, I think, of, of uh, you know, how the church was trying to enforce its boundaries upon me and how problematic, in my opinion, those were. Um, all right. So without any further ado, I'm going to start with uh, the first interview. This is uh, May 1st, 2012, uh, Bishop James Stevenson. And this interview occurs um, in uh, North Logan, um, in, in our little ward there. And uh, I hope I hope you guys uh, find value in this interview. And if not, uh, 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 I understand. Uh, all right, here we go. First interview. Bishop. Well, hello. Close the door. Uh, sure. How are you tonight? Good. How are you? Doing well. So have the have the iPad, huh? Is that what it is? Yeah. 
Uh, those have become quite the popular item, and I have seen them around and had people show me things, but I've never, uh, never really played with them. Uh, more convenient than a laptop, or just smaller? For me, it, um, I have to read a lot of PDF files for my dissertation, and I want to have to print them all out. And if you're reading something for a long time, holding a laptop, like in right. bed or on the couch. Hurt your wrists and stuff. So this is like a light, a, a big Kindle. Exactly. Okay. But you can check email on it, you know, and do other stuff. So. Another topic. Uh, haven't seen you much out of church. Uh, I, I thought you'd kind of committed to to be coming as much as you could. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, just wondering if uh, I was going to see you soon or where we're, where we're at there. Yeah, I, uh, I actually enjoy coming, and I have come some. I don't know. I, I have a minimum where I, I, it's really important to me to come at least once a month, and I think I've been making that. But I, ha I do travel on some weekends. Like I was in Boston last weekend, and, and then sometimes there are family things. But I'm, I'm committed to staying active. Uh, so, so I don't know how to bridge the gap between what you've seen and what I'm feeling I've been doing, but okay. there's probably um, some something in the middle between what how much you've seen me and how much I've been there, but there's also been some things that caused us to miss. So, okay. But I, I don't think my commitment's changed on my end. Okay. So uh, still committed to being active and uh, yeah. coming to church. And uh, last time we talked a little bit about uh, where your testimony was. I think I, last time, boy, that's been months ago. You may not even remember that conversation, but no, I asked, I, I did ask you about uh, specifically about your testimony of Jesus Christ and and where you were at with that. And I uh, felt like we had a good discussion. Uh, I feel like that's about where it was, or a little stronger, a little less, a little where are we at. Hmm. Such a <laughs> Such a big topic. Yeah, uh, I I still consider myself a believer in God, and I still believe in the, in the, what I consider to be the core teachings of Jesus, and try to follow them. And. The things that the things that would be different. Well, if there's if there'd be any difference in the way that I would articulate my testimony by Christ than yours, it would be just in areas where I don't have an understanding or certainty. But I don't deny anything that, that you would say. I just sometimes, like I told you before, just get confused about certain things or don't understand certain things, and so I don't kind of put my focus on them and just try and focus on living the behavioral guidelines he taught us to live like faith and repentance and love and charity and kindness and obedience and all that stuff there are, those are all good principles yeah uh, and that's good uh, the first one you mentioned though the faith part that would be easier if you were here more. <laughs> it would. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad we're not uh, declining in that area. Because that is something that I worry about when I don't see people, is, is where they're at with their, with their faith and, and their testimony. I uh, 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 want to help you in that regard if there's things that I can do. So... Uh. I think I told I think I told you this a couple times ago, when when we met before I met with the state president. The hardest the hardest part about coming to church for me is it's not the people because I really love the people and I really love coming. That's good. I, I, I it hurts me to not come to church. It's not something where I'm like, woohoo! I I feel a big loss when I don't come to church. And I've always loved it. Um, what's hard for me is sometimes things get taught that go against my values, and that's just sometimes. Um, 
and so it's it's hard to hear things that feel wrong to you spiritually um, and then sometimes uh, I have a different perspective than people and I just when I share it it makes people uncomfortable I feel like or I worry but then if I just quiet I feel like I'm kind of a second-class citizen so I don't want to be disruptive right but being quiet makes me feel like I'm not really accepted as as a full member and so I I just but I don't I really don't want to ruin like I used to I used to teach elders quorum and there would always be like four or five guys who just were really bothered by the things I'd want to talk about or want to work through and I just well, others were really grateful. They're like, "Wow, we love your lessons, and we're really glad you do it." But I never was able to feel good about making those few brethren uncomfortable, right? And so that's just that's the hardest part for me is just I feeling hear, so different. I did hear that you gave great lessons, so I've I've never heard anything uh, other than that. Uh, I do believe that uh, you would could have the, from our conversations the potential to get on some tangents that uh, uh, could uh, <laughs> could cause people to be uncomfortable or to have some disagreements. Uh, and depending on the setting, uh, yeah, that may or may not be the the right uh, venue. But uh, uh, but I uh, I did not ever hear anything uh, other than that you were an excellent teacher. So that's good. But that's that's what I struggle with. I, I don't like I don't like splitting up the family. I I'm supportive of my kids being in the church. I'm so I that's just the thing I have to figure out how to work through. That's that's really the problem. And the only temple recommend question that I feel like I can't answer in the right way is just this this tithing thing. And we we've started paying some tithing again. So we're, we don't feel good about having our family benefit from affiliation with the church and not supporting it. So I don't, what we've done is we've taken a good chunk of the 10% and we pay that, but we save some of that and just give it to a few other causes that we feel good about. And I'm not proud of that. I'm not like throwing that in your face. I'm just telling you that's how we've worked through not feeling super good about a couple things so I don't know I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult I'm really not. no no I'm, I'm once again just trying to see where you're at because uh, uh, yeah and that's uh, that actually is interesting to me that uh, uh, that that's the one that, uh, that that you highlighted that you're concerned about so as far as the others I mean the first three questions are all about testimony uh, and so uh, well that's a, that's an interesting thing because you know I just I just visited the Cambridge Ward in you know, Boston, Massachusetts. And, you know, depending on the bishop, you'll you'll get different perspectives on... On what a testimony is, or...? On, like, what's a problem and what's not a problem. You know what I mean? And having doubts, uh, some, some... And I'm not... I don't say this is a judgment. I don't. But but I think there's sometimes different thresholds of empathy for doubts, you know, for like I feel sometimes I feel in a in a conservative place like my doubts or questions are kind of looked down upon. There are other places where it's like doubt all you want and questioning is good and you know, none of us know for sure anything really and, and there are different gifts of the spirit and so I, I guess I'm just saying that I, there are. I know that there are bishops who, if, if I were to express my concerns about the atonement or Jesus or God or whatever, and just say I have doubts or I have concerns or I have questions or I don't understand, they'd be like, "Don't worry about it. As long as you're trying and you're working for it and you're studying and you're." Helpful. Well, see, I think you hit the key right there. If you're working towards things, to have a perfect knowledge and understanding or a perfect testimony in all areas is is probably uh, 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 not that many people could. Yeah, can say that. Yeah, uh, but uh, you can have uh, the uh, 
the burning in your bosom, you can have the witnesses that you need to know that the, that the major components are, are correct. And once you've got that down, then you can start working on those little ones. But yeah, if you're working towards it, that's, uh, that is different than... Uh, 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 so, to, so to me, yeah, uh, I don't see a problem with people having doubts uh, if they are s striving to to find out truth. And I, uh, I really, I, you, it may, it may be natural for you to think that because I'm not always in church that I'm not working at it, but I work really hard at it, believe it or not, and I'm really trying. I'm not goofing around. I'm not like looking for ways to get out of things. I, I I'm a pretty I'm a pretty serious guy and I I work really hard at my religion and trying to find out what's right and study and pray and and it's just it's just hard I'm just it's just people like me have a hard time we don't want to you know it's 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 not something we would choose if I could choose I would I would feel good about coming to church and I would come all the time and I would have a calling, and I would contribute, and not split my family up. And I'm really, I'm still working at it. That's how I feel. Um, the uh, the third question in the temple recommend is about the restoration of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Do you have a testimony of that? Well, see, I can answer all those questions the way that that you would, the way that I would need to to get a temple recommend. It's just about how I would describe what that means. Okay. So well, do, I believe I, that, do I believe that there's a God and that God inspired what's led to today's church? Yes. Okay. Well, part of the reason I'm asking about that is because that restoration, if there, if there, is, if there was no restoration, uh, then we have no priesthood, then there is no reason for you to even want to uh, baptize Winston. I mean, that, that, whole, that whole scenario just, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, be a complete waste of time, actually, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so the well, so would the restoration be a waste of time if there weren't, uh, if we didn't have Jesus Christ and the atonement and, and uh, the gospel plan itself. So, uh, those, I guess, are significant questions, and maybe they're asking that order too. Uh, the first question is about. God the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. So do we, do we believe that God's out there? And then this is what he did for us, and uh, those second two, they're all, they're all related. And, uh, but, uh, well, I believe that the priesthood has power, and that and the, the church is inspired by God. Good. Okay. And that hasn't changed in years. Now, details... You know, we might have some. <laughs> well, I know you've had some frustrations, or maybe that's not the right word. Some uh, some concerns about uh, some of the uh, history of the church. Which, by the way, uh, the church itself. There's some history out there that's not very pretty. I mean, I could I could sit and list all the things that you know, things where we were wronged, and some things that we did that were flat out wrong, uh, and. Uh, the people of the church are not perfect. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's that hasn't been an issue for me in a long time. Okay. The, the the thing that I struggle with is feeling like I'm forced to say that other churches are false. You know, I I don't have a, I don't have a hard time saying our church is inspired of God, but I don't. I, I we've talked about this. I just don't like saying that. If someone gets baptized Methodist, that that's illegitimate. You know what I mean? Or, and I don't even know if it's legitimate. I just don't like being put in the position to have to judge others and say that we're better. It just makes me. I mean, it feels unChristlike to me for a church to say we're better than everybody else. So I just don't like to think uh, that way. And, and I think. Uh Part of what you're saying is very accurate. We should not. Uh, we we don't ever want to give the impression of holier than thou or or, or uh, something else. Uh, it's uh, in in my way of thinking, which often comes across just like you've described. Though uh, uh, we have we have the whole truth and more to offer, uh, and 
and this is not to uh, demean or diminish anything that these other churches have. It's just that uh, uh, certain things have been revealed to us, particularly the detailed nature of the plan and the, the, the purpose of life. Uh, you know, it's, it's just so... Uh, well, to me, it is so clear and uh, and helpful to have uh, have that direction. And uh, having spent a lot of time, and I have to admit, in almost all cases, I've spent the time with Christian religions and people of Christian faiths. I have not, uh, oh, I've delved a little into some of the other beliefs, but it's been uh, mostly Christianity. But to, to hear uh, their beliefs and their, their aspirations and their goals to me, they're they're nice about to hear, but when you can realize that we can progress and become much much more than than just returning uh, uh, to Heavenly Father, that's a wonderful thing. But when we can continue to have we eternal progression in itself, just become better and better as we go. Uh, if we'll just follow His plan, keep His commandments. To me, that's a uh, that is something more and extra, and that's that's what I want to uh, want to share with people. It's it's not uh, at all to to make them feel uh, bad about where they're at or about the. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't believe that Mormons intentionally are judgmental or arrogant. I don't I don't believe that that's in anyone's heart really. It's just a technicality that is meaningful to me to never want to demean another's faith, and so. So I can accept the restoration and not want to say things like this is the only true church. You know, I just don't like saying those types of things. You know, makes me uncomfortable. But I can say this church is inspired by God. I think we're kind of saying the same thing, maybe, or at least very uh, well, similar. I, yeah, I, very, very similar. Sim similar. Uh, yeah, not I'm exactly not. the same thing, because I, I honestly uh, I would uh, not uh, want, I would be careful where I said it and in the settings and the way I said it, but, uh, but I do believe uh, that this is, uh, has the, com the complete truth. And so in that sense, you could say, as the, as the Doctrine and Covenants says, that it's the only true and living church on the face of the earth. Uh, and uh, but these other churches came historically from uh, from where a lot of that truth came from. So there uh, there's there's uh, a lot of good in them, a lot of good in them, and uh, that's a that's something that I think that sometimes we can get yeah uh, where we can be offensive to other people. Now part of my reasoning for that though too is uh, as you look at the difference. Uh, in these religions and the difference in teaching of doctrine and things uh, and you can't have conflicting things both be true and correct so at some point the other the logical side of me says okay uh, yeah uh, <laughs> These two are not conducive to each other, so one, one or the other or both are incorrect, uh, and that's that's. Uh, so so I guess I am okay saying, yeah, uh, we we've got it. <laughs> so I even think that we I I it feels like there's even truths and doctrines that we don't fully understand. Oh, I believe that too. And and things that aren't yet revealed. And, I agree there. And even I think sometimes the church makes mistakes. Uh, I'll go with the church making mistakes. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, uh, that's why I want humility on this side, too. Uh, yeah. The, uh, but the, the, the church, and see, that's you almost want to hesitate when you say that, but the church is led by people who make mistakes. Everyone, uh, you know, that's... Uh, and uh, there is also a progression of knowledge and understanding. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. I don't mean that in a bad way. I think our church is amazing. Like I don't even Joseph Smith, amazing. I, you know, I know he had thirty-two wives. Still think he's amazing, right? He was amazing. But I, I even and I didn't have that count. I knew he had multiple wives. I did not know the thirty-two. <laughs> 32. <laughs> okay, were all of those living wives, or were uh, a lot of them proxies after? Mm, or, most well, of them were. Almost all of them were living. Were they? Okay. I know that there was some, at least some stories uh, given about people after his death, in fact, that were mm -hmm. being sealed or married to him. And I, uh, but that was the just a percent, small percentage. Okay. 
Yeah, but I, I love the church. I really love the church. I love our word. I love the gospel. I miss the temple. <laughs> it's not fun being me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of those things we're talking about is eternal progression. So, uh, you know, as, as, as you're ready, and uh, uh, if I can be of assistance to you, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I, I would like you to uh, commit to get here as uh, frequently as you can so that... Uh, uh, yeah. I got a punch card so you know when I'm here just to make sure you're not missing me. Because <laughs> when I'm here... Oh, you don't know I'm here. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. The last time I honestly saw you here that I remember, uh, was one of your daughters performing? That's about a month ago. Uh, or more than more than that. Did, uh, or was someone else performing? Okay. Anyway. I've had a couple trips. I've okay. been to Boston. I've been there. Yeah. I really don't remember seeing you in April. But you... Uh, so, so I've been a little concerned. Oh, well, I appreciate uh, it. Uh, I I keep I, I maintain my commitment to coming. Okay, very good. Uh, is there anything I can do for you or your family? I think we're I think we're doing pretty well. I appreciate you calling me in. It makes me feel good. Well, uh, yeah, I was just uh, like I said, a little concerned, a little curious about where we're where we're at with things. So, uh, oh. I I told Brother Lundberg that I'm happy to help out with Cub Scouts whenever. Oh, he wants excellent. Needs me. Okay. Because I, I I think it's a great way for me to contribute where I won't be a threat and and contribute to something that my son's benefiting from and spend a little time with him. So. Well, that's that, that's good to know. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, we. Uh, Cubs is a is a great thing where the the tasks aren't too difficult. The kids can have fun, and at that age, they can be so, uh, for lack of a better word, just silly. Some of the from the humor to the things they enjoy doing, but uh, but those interactions are great, uh, and in a positive way, uh, where they're uh, working with some adults that do uh, do good things. So so thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, that's all I had. That's it. Hope I didn't keep you too long. No, that's great. <laughs> so I was in trouble. Uh, no, I just, like I said, <laughs> just, just curious where you were at and you know, things were going all right. All right, it's good to know. Thank you, Bishop. It's good to see you. It's good to see you hey, too. Brother Lloyd. Brother John, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. Good. What's up, man? You guys are all right. So um, that is the first interview that I had with uh, Bishop James Stevenson. Uh, uh, I can see that some of you are still uh, tuning in and listening. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, not a lot to say about that interview. I think uh, Brother Stevenson's a nice guy, kind guy, wants to do what's right. Um, a couple things that I noted that I just thought were interesting about that interview. One was that uh, um, he he... Um, he he clearly believed that it was God's one true church and and had the complete truth, but he admitted that he would be careful where he said it, um, uh, that he wouldn't want to offend people, but uh, but that the truth was he certainly did believe the church was true. Um, I, I clearly surprised him. He didn't know that he he said that he knew all about the church's history, and what I found out later was that he he actually didn't know much more than the correlated stuff and and clearly what you heard there when i mentioned the number of joseph smith's wives he had never heard that there were so many and uh and also um he you know he had bought into the the teaching that they were all kind of sealed to him in name only but uh or celestially only but that um uh but that maybe he didn't live with them in all in all deed 